Morning, morning. I mean, I, I guess the, one of the positive things about just having one service is I get to get through all my one hour's worth of notes. So just sit back and relax. Um, how many, just, just by a show of hands, how many thinkers do I have in the room? Like, you like to think. I like to, I like to think. And then sometimes you have a conversation and you end up spending hours, weeks, years thinking about that conversation. Anybody ever done that? Or is that just me? Let me tell you guys a quick story about one of these uh, conversations that I had in story that I just, gosh, almost, uh, I'm going to age myself a little bit. This is almost two decades worth of constantly and continually mulling over the story. So in my early 20s, my wife and I got, had been married for a couple of years, and we were doing ministry, and I was bivocational. And so like a good minister is ministering at nights, and I got a job as a car salesperson during the day, right? Fits perfectly. And one day I get to work and I see a couple and I engage, right? I'm like, I'm locked in. All right, I'm going to make some money. I'm going to make some money. With my luck, I end up spending the entire day with them. And it's a loss leader. It's like the one loss leader that we have on the lot. It's like the one car that we're not going to make any money off of. And so I spent the entire day helping them and I'm getting 100 bucks. And the guys that next to me are like, yeah, I mean, I just, uh, you know, I just got uh, it's seven grand. And I'm like, you just need to walk away right now. I'm going to hurt you. <laughs> so I, I pep talk myself and I'm like, hey, there's always tomorrow. I'm going to be here tomorrow and it's going to be good. So th the next day rolls around. I get to work again and my finance manager pulls me inside and he goes, hey, we have a problem. I'm like, of course we have a problem. He goes, like, we can't get a hold of them and we're calling to verify their employment and they haven't been there for two months. I need you to drive over to their house and see what's going on. I'm like, okay. I'm like, great, this is going to be day two of uh, only 100 bucks, right? I'm not getting any more money out of this trip. So I get there, and as I'm, as I'm starting to park, the sun is glistening, and I see the car that they bought, and I realize, like, right as I'm parking, there's something wrong here. I get up, and I get into the car, and I realize there's this huge dent in the hood, and there's this huge dent in the windshield, like, just a perfect dent. I mean, it looked like somebody took a rock and just, right, right into it. And I'm like, this explains why they're not answering the phone calls, right? So I go knock on the door, and this lady opens the door, and it happens to be the mom, and she leads me to the sun, and I go in the back, and there's this dark room, and I see the client, the guy that bought the car, with a neck brace on, with a head, like, head wrapped up. He's got something around his ribs, and his leg has a, a, one of those temporary casts, and it's hanging from the bedpost. And I did a quick like, calculation, and I was like, I, I think he's what made the dents, the dent in the car. So I started talking to him, and I'm like, dude, what happened? So like, well, we got home, and my, we were drinking, and we were celebrating, and my wife started driving up and down the street really fast, and I did the only thing I could do to, to stop her. I, I stepped out in front of the car. Genius. That's, that's awesome. That's, that's a great move. So I'm sitting here, and I'm a minister, right, at this point. Like, I'm ministering, I'm doing all this stuff, and as this guy is telling me the story, I'm just struck with so much sadness. And I realize that I'm not getting my 100 bucks. <laughs> We're going to tow this car, and I'm not getting my money. I'm, I spent a day and a half on this guy, and I'm not getting any money. And see, what I was, I was successful in doing, what the disciples couldn't do or didn't do, which was to take somebody that's broken and hungry, and I sent him away. I took somebody that, and, and I, now when I think back on it, I'm like, God was like setting it up on a silver platter. He's like, look, the guy can't go anywhere. Minister to him. And I'm like, I, I remember walking out going, God, I'm so sick and tired of this bivocational stuff. Like, I can't wait just to do full-time ministry. I just want to be in full-time ministry so I don't have to deal with stuff like this. Right? Come on. And I, and I realized that I, for the longest time, and so many believers are looking for significance in God continually because we're actually looking for it in the wrong place. See, the, the, the word Pastor Brandon shared, uh, kingdom shows up 52 times. In the, in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it shows up 152 times. You know how many word times the word church shows up? Still the three times. And yet, for some reason, we've mastered everything about churchism, and we really don't know a whole lot about the kingdom, right? You can go to a call, you, you know, you can go to Bible college, and, and let me just make, make sure I preface this, like, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with having degrees and having, right, like, having these credentials. I'm saying there's something wrong when we put all our eggs in one basket, and we think that's how we're going to get satisfied, and we're going to find our significance in God by doing these things, right? 
You can go to you can go to a Bible college and get a, a degree, which I wanted to do for the longest time in church leadership. And now I look back and I'm like, I, I want kingdom leadership. Like I I want to I want to be somebody in kingdom, right? So here's here's the problem with wanting to find. See, me and so many of us, we try to find significance in a position in the church. Here's the problem with that. God doesn't intend, nor does he ever intended, or will he intend, to fulfill that desire in us through a position in the church. That system just doesn't exist. And so, so we being the clever humans that we are, we, we, gotta, we gotta figure something out, right? We gotta create something so that we can self-satisfy ourselves. And so what we've actually done is we've gone to the world, we've taken the world system of finding satisfaction, right, and significance, and we've taken that and we've jammed it into Christianity so we have something to engage. Right? So the problem with that is what ends up happening is I end up living life thinking, thinking that I'm going to find significance in God the same way that an unbeliever finds it in the world. Something wrong with that. Right? So I'm going to show you guys a graph again. I want to, before we, I show you guys this graph, um, I want to make sure I note that this isn't, I'm not saying that this is how the church operates or this is how we've been operating. I'm just saying this is the lie of what we think that the church operates. But I want to, I'm kind of visual, so I want to show you guys the difference between living in the kingdom and living out of, uh, out of the church mindset, okay? So the first one is the church system. So what we do with the church system, I'm going to step down a little bit because it's awesome to have additional visual. So we start in obscurity, right? You're a nothing and nobody. You, don't, you start out with nothing. And then you step into leadership and then authority. And then at some point on your journey through this, you find significance, right? You find identity. There's a reason why I put identity on there, and we'll see that in a second. Now, here's the difference between living in the church system and living in the kingdom system. See, with the kingdom, you actually start with identity. You actually start with significance. And you actually work your way into obscurity, right? There's, there's a difference in that, in the satisfaction. Now... I will say that the reason why obscurity is on there last isn't because people aren't going to know who you are. The reason why it's on the bottom is because it won't matter who knows who you are. Right? It's not going to matter. Jesus, Jesus being the son of God, right? He says, I'm the servant. I came to serve you. You're not going to put that on your LinkedIn profile unless you really know who you are. Right? So let's take a look at a couple of um, scriptures. That's the one. One more. Matthew 3, 17, and a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. This happens to, to be before Jesus does any kind of ministry. Remember, in the kingdom, we actually start with significance, and we walk into obscurity through serving, right? So before Jesus does anything, the Father says that. Now, this isn't in my notes, but I'll, I'll, I'll share this real quick. The beautiful thing about this is, you know, right, so we, have, we, we talk a lot about identity in the church, Right? But what we do is we end up leaving people in, on this like, road of trying to find the identity themselves. But if you look at this, Jesus didn't say he's a good son and the Father is pleased with him. God said that about him. And so if you look at the relationship between Jesus and the Father, Jesus always talked about how good the Father is. And the Father talked about how great the Son is and how well-pleased he is with him. So it's not our job as sons and daughters to walk around and try to convince ourselves and others how great of a child we are. That's God's job, right? We get to just brag on who he is, and he'll brag on who we are. Come on. So next verse, Matthew 20. You notice how this comes after 13, 13 and then 20? There's a reason for that. This is what Jesus says, and this kind of correlates with the, um, the church system, right, and the world system. Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great, become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be the first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. It's a little bit of a different concept, right? The other part I want to talk about is, you know, a lot of times when we, when we talk about church and, church and being in the, in the church and finding significance, what I find is there's two th trains of thoughts. The first one is I have to find significance in the church. The other th train of thought is, well, I don't have a degree in standing in the, gra in the gap. And so that means if I'm not in a position, then I'm excused from the Great Commission, 
right? Which means I don't have a position in the church. That means I get to offshore all my Christian responsibilities to the pastors, right? If you have a position in the church, then you get to do all this stuff, right? And what we've done is we've created a bunch of CEOs, Christmas and Easter onlys, right? <laughs> Where we bring people and we're like, God, I really hope that the pa Pastor Brandon teaches, you know, has a really great sermon and he leads them to Jesus and then I can take credit for it because I'm the one that told them to come to church, right? <laughs> Um, I, I want to just take a second real quick with you guys and, and look at the Great Commission together. Can we do that? Yeah. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to, to the very end of age. You know what I don't see in that? I don't see a clause that says if you live in the 21st century and you're extremely busy, you don't get to pray for people. That you're excused from praying for the sick. That you don't get to disciple, you don't have to disciple anybody. God's like, listen, I understand you're really busy. You're, you're good, you're exempt. I, I just don't see that, right? I don't see that in here. Um, and so what I'd like to do is I, I'd like to take a stand as a church for us to make the commission great again. All right, leave that there. Hey, so in, in closing, I want I to tell you guys another story of how some of the conversations and some of the things that I've done kind of shifted when I begin to understand that I live actually out of the kingdom of God, not out of the church of God, right? Three times versus 152 times. So I worked in, uh, worked in banking, and this was, I mean, I have tons and tons of stories, but this is one that was kind of pivotal, but that, that, that kind of, set the trajectory of just living this out. So I worked in banking and I was a manager and I was standing behind the glass, you know, the, the aquarium where all the bankers uh, or the tellers are. So I'm standing with the tellers and I'm, I'm doing a um, coaching moment and I look over and almost like in a movie, I look over and I see a lady that's just standing in the lobby with an envelope in her hand and she's looking around. And there's a bunch of people that are passing her and nobody's engaging with her, right? And I'm thinking, God, I'm going to get a bad survey. This is bad, right? So, so I run out to her, and I'm like, hi, how's it going? Can I help you? And she's like, yes, I need to, I need to open an account and, and deposit this check. So I start looking around. I'm trying to find one of my bankers to take the check and deposit it and open an account. And everybody's busy. So I, I invite her, and I say, well, I, I can help you out. Come sit down with me. And so we're going to open an account. As we start opening the account, she shares it with me, and she says, see, the thing is, this is my first check from my disability because, since I've gotten diagnosed with cancer. And I need to come in here and I need to open an account and I need to deposit it. And the first thing I started doing was I tried to shut off my spiritual ears because I'm like, God, I know you're going to talk to me about something right now. You're going to ask me to do something. I don't want to get fired. <laughs> right? So, and my manager's desk was like right around the corner from me. So I'm sitting there and I look at her and I go, you know what? If I get fired, I get fired. I look at her and I go, hey, can I just share something with you? And I, I have no idea if she's a Christian. It's not like she had a cross on, you know, cross out and stuff, right? And I'm like, hey, it's a sign. Okay, let's pray. I tell her, I say, listen, I don't know about you, but I believe in Jesus. I believe that he's a miracle working God. And I believe that there's power in his name and there's power in his blood. And there's power in what he, what he says. And he says, all authority has been given in, to me on heaven and earth. Can we pray for this? And she goes, yeah. So I look around and I just grab her hand and I just bow our heads and we're just contending. So imagine we're, we're just sitting in this desk in the middle of a lobby. There's a bunch of people that are running around. There's people coming in and out. There's, there's bankers, there's tellers, there's managers. And we're just locked in and we're just contending for God. We're just contending for the miracle of God to happen. Right? We open the account and she leaves. And a couple months later, I'm standing back in the same place that I was. It was almost kind of creepy. I'm standing and I'm engaged with the, the tellers and I look over and I see the same lady standing in the lobby. And I'm like, oh, wow, like this is kind of weird. There's people walking around, nobody's engaging her and she's just standing there, but this time she's looking around. I go out and I'm like, hi, how's it going? She's like, great, do you remember me? I said, yeah, sure. She said, can we sit down? And I said, yeah, of course. So we sit down and um, I'm gonna try not to cry because my daughter always tells me I'm an ugly crier, so. Uh, <laughs> So we sit down and she says, do you remember I came in here a couple months ago? 
and I had gotten my first disability check since being, being diagnosed with cancer. And I said, yeah. She said, well, I wanted to come in and deposit my first check being back to work since being cleared of cancer. Church, let's stand for a second. You know, uh, church, I tell you this not to impress you, but to impress upon you that when we begin to live out of kingdom, we stop searching for our burning bush and realize that we're the burning bush. And we actually carry with us an invitation for the world to encounter the great I am. Can we pray on that? Yes. Father, we just thank you. God, you are so good. You are so holy. You are so righteous. God, you have paid the price. You have shed your blood. You have done it all. God, and all you are asking for is for a people that will just stand in agreement with you, God, and find our significance in who we are in you, God, not what we do. God, I'm just reminded of, of Scripture where it talks about um, abiding, and as we abide, there's fruit that's produced. It's not our job to produce the fruit. It's our job to abide. You produce the fruit. So, Father, would you help us? Would you help us shift our mind from, from being so church-minded, Father God, trying to find significance in, in silly positions and titles and, and offshoring our responsibilities, our God-given responsibilities to standing up, God, so that when we encounter people that are scared, we can be, we can be the, the beacon of hope. God, that we wouldn't succumb to um, practical atheism where we declare and we say that we are Christians, but we are, we're just freaking out and scared out of our minds. And that happens when we understand that the kingdom has way more resources, has unlimited resources, where if we look to the church, it's, it's, it's limited. Father, would you help us understand that, that church is a place where we gather, but your kingdom is a movement. And that we are called to be a movement. We are called to be a part of a movement. In Jesus' name. Let's go to our prayer team forward. Church, just put your hands out in front of you. Father, we say a baptism of fire in Jesus' name. Anoint us to pray for those in need. I pray for confidence and boldness. And press right now upon our hearts to remember those in need. So right now, remind us of people, of names, of faces, who we need to call, who we need to visit, who we need to bring aid to. God, we will respond in faith as a church. Have your way in this virus in Jesus' name. Lord, we ask for a turning of the tide, fear to leave in this nation, and the peace of God and the faith of your people to rise up in this moment. We are expectant for all you have in store for us. In Jesus' name, everybody declared Amen. Amen. Come on, church.